So it's been a little while. I haven't actually sewn anything since I made that uh, 18th century inspired dress to go to Cornwall. I had a wonderful time in Cornwall, I had a brilliant holiday. Since coming back, I've had a lot on and my health hasn't been on top form and I just haven't had the time or the energy really, physical or mental, to do sewing. And so I've, I've had a slightly longer break than I anticipated, it's now August, but I'm ready, I think I'm ready to start getting back into things slowly and gently. And I've got, of course, as always, I've got loads of grand costume projects that I could be working on, but none of that is really grabbing me at the moment. I just realistically know I'm not up to it. And so instead, I'm taking part in a little collaboration which is being hosted by Jeanette from A Perfect Touch. Now Jeanette makes absolutely amazing things. I highly recommend you go and look at Jeanette's work. It's fantastic. And Jeanette suggested that as a kind of fun little collaboration, we should do a pocket swap. Now, this all sparked from this amazing pattern called the Fantastical Utility Pocket. And it's made by uh, make her Miss Violet Needle Turn and the pattern is available to buy on her website. And it's a, 18th century pocket reimagined as like a sewing tool belt or I suppose any kind of tool belt you like. And you may remember if you've been around on my channel for a little while, my video for co-covid last year, uh, sewing with a disability. In that video one of the things I recommended was to tie your supplies to yourself. So when I saw this collaboration suggested I thought I have to be a part of that because that is so up my street. So I've, I've printed it out and I've got the pattern here and I got in touch with Jeanette and she signed me up and my pocket swap recipient is going to be Jimmy from the Welsh Viking. Ah! Round of applause for Jimmy. Hey. I realise that my audience is probably very different from Jimmy's audience, so if you don't know about the, Jimmy and his channel The Welsh Viking, Jimmy's a PhD student and a Viking reenactor, and he makes videos about history, most specifically Vikings, and they tend to be a bit more about research than they are specifically about sewing. I, th I believe Jimmy's also an actor, and so the way he delivers it is really engaging, it's very funny, and so I'm really excited to be making Jimmy a pocket. And Jeanette suggested that as part of the co collab we should use scrap fabric from some of our projects. Now, there's an issue with that because I tend to work with slinky 1940s rayons, and I don't know how well they will work for, more, you know, it's got to be quite sturdy, it's got to be quite heavy duty, this pocket's going to get quite a lot of use, it's going to have scissors and pointy things in it. I'm going to go through my fabric stash and my scraps and see if I've got anything that I think will be appropriate for this and also Jimmy will like, because obviously making it for him, I want him to use it and wear it and like it. And I've been playing with some design ideas about what do I want to sort of theme it? because, you know, obviously Jimmy's channel's about Vikings mostly, so my first instinct was like, oh, I should make this Viking themed. Hmm. However, one of the key threads of Jimmy's work is like busting myths, and uh, it turns out a lot of what I thought I knew about the Vikings is wrong. So I feel that maybe I should just steer clear of everything Viking related because I don't want to make a fool of myself. Jimmy is a fellow Brit, he's a Welshman, so I've got some greens and stuff in my stash, so maybe we'll do like a Welsh dragon or something. I don't know. I'm gonna have a look through my stash and see what I can come up with. I started by looking through my bin of offcuts and it was actually really nice to look through my scraps and see all my past projects, many of which you've seen here too on YouTube. We've got some of Robin Hood, some of Little Dorrit, and as you saw at the beginning, I've got a lot of that IKEA duvet left over, but also some things you haven't seen yet. I've got quite a few reds and greens, so we could do like a Welsh flag theme. If you're unfamiliar with the Welsh flag, it looks like this. I know as well, conveniently, um, Jimmy dropped a video this morning about the types of fabric he likes to buy, and I know he's a bit snobby about his uh, fibre content, so I don't think I'll be sending him any polyester. I've got a few bits of wool here though, so hopefully we can get something nice, natural, fibery for him, if that's what he likes. I'm going to play around, I'm going to look at the yardages I have, and I'm going to look at which pattern pieces will fit where and things like that and make my decision based on that and see what happens. I ended up doing a few sketches and settling on a design, but I decided to include some more decoration, which took an unusual turn. 
The other thing about Jimmy's channel is, right, okay, because like a lot of Viking imagery and a lot of Viking culture and heritage has been co-opted by white supremacists. And so Jimmy, bless him, has this almost constant fight against fascists, white supremacists, Nazis, for want of a better word, on in his comment section and his channel and things like that. And it's a real shame because there are lots of people who are genuinely interested in their Scandinavian heritage or whatever, and then there are just assholes. So I thought, I'm, and I really hope Jimmy gets it. I really hope he, but I'm sure he is. I'm sure he will get it. I don't know why. He's just like quite a cultured guy. I'm sure he's heard of Woody Guthrie. But anyway, so what I thought I'd do is I would paint on the pocket. Uh, will it focus on it? This pocket kills fascists. And uh, I just hope he gets the joke. With the design settled upon, I began cutting out all the pieces I needed from the relevant bits of fabric. You may remember from when I was making that Robin Hood costume that this piece of wool was pretty moth-eaten, and so I had to make sure to cut around the moth holes. The piece fit perfectly, but it was close. It was the same for the green gabardine. I had just enough scrap fabric to make it work, but not a millimetre more. This craft cotton I used for a dress that you haven't seen the making of yet, but you might have spotted it in a few videos. I used it as a lining for one of the pockets and originally intended to use it for the pincushion, but decided against it later. The other parts of the pincushion were made from the green walls and I just used the printed pattern piece instead of cutting new paper for the stabilizer. So I've managed to get everything out of each bit of scrap fabric that I wanted to. However, now I'm facing a bit of a dilemma because I didn't think about the, um, the binding, first of all, because this pocket has bias binding around it, or the waistband. Well, basically I don't have any of the green gabardine left. I've only got really, really scrappy bits. And I've got quite a bit of wool left, but it's so thick that I don't think it's going to be uh, usable as a binding. So I'm a little bit stuck because the only thing, I had originally intended to incorporate this fabric and I have it lining one of the pocket sections but actually it just doesn't go it's too grey it's too cool so uh, that's out and I've got some red linen left but then all of a sudden it makes it you can't see it let's let me show you what it looks like I think it makes it look too Christmassy I think that's really what's bothering me about it I also have the issue of I haven't even got this layer on it's just going to be so thick down the bottom here because I'm going to have the backing of wool the gabardine some other lining, the wool, two layers of linen, the cotton and the gabardine on the top and interfacing as well. And I mean, look how thick that already is. I haven't even got any of the interfacing in there yet. This is why I think using the using this as a binding, you know what I mean? Once you get four, la four more layers of that for a binding, on top of that, it's just not gonna work really. Uh, but my other thought was, of course, <laughs> green projects I've made on this channel. This is the fabric from that very first 1944 dress that I made. So I'm contemplating making this the binding because this is quite thin and slippery and so it won't add much bulk around the bottom here. I think that would look quite nice. Actually, it looks kind of camo-y, which I quite like. Doesn't look like a really obvious floral, <sighs> but I really don't know what I'm going to do with this binding. Well, I've also got the green velvet. We could do a green velvet binding. Do I really hate myself? Am I really going to do a green velvet binding? Oh, that does look quite nice, though. Makes it a bit glam, actually. Look, let's have a look at that. You know, I do quite like that. Why is it... I can make you some most difficult things ever, don't I? I suppose I've got plenty of little Dorrit. We can have some purple binding. Oh, do you know what? I don't hate that. So having played around with this for a bit longer, I'm going with the, um, the purple sateen from Little Dorrit, actually. I think it somehow it's in the same warm colour story, whereas the others aren't. They're all a bit cooler, which I think it's nice as well to get her in there because it was such a big project on my channel, so uh, it's nice to include her. I have to cut the waistband now and the binding and this and all the interfacing, of course. So I'm going to crack on with that. Having cut lots of rulu for the little Dorrit, I had a piece of the sateen that was already cut on the bias, so I just cut a few more strips to the correct width. I passed the bias strips through my bias binding maker to easily press in the folds. 
I don't always find this step necessary when making binding, but getting the sateen to fold nicely can be tricky, so I found pressing in the folds beforehand much easier. Before I committed to making lots of binding, I tested it out against the layers of the pocket to check I was happy. Then it was on to cutting out the interfacing. As the pocket isn't likely to be washed, I decided to use up a lot of this cheap papery kind of interfacing I have in my stash. There was a lot of interfacing. Every layer of the pocket needed interfacing. I'm not sure with my sturdy walls if it was entirely necessary, but the loose weaves of some of them were pretty unstable, so I think it was for the best in the end. And then it was time to start sewing. I began by joining the lining of each pocket section to its corresponding main fabric along the top edge. I stitched these together in a chain to save on thread and make sure I didn't get my pieces confused. I then pressed open those seams before rolling the lining around to the wrong side and pressing in place. You can just see that I didn't fold it directly on the seam so that the lining fabric wouldn't be seen from the right side. I repeated this for all the pocket pieces, but the red linen one had a curved edge, which meant I had to clip into the curve to get it to turn around to the other side. I snipped lots of little Vs out of the seam allowance and then used my tailor's ham to press that curved seam. Then I could roll the lining around to the inside and press it flat. So I've started on the construction of the pocket and I've realized that I've actually designed my layers in the wrong order. And so this green and red section, which I was hoping would represent the flat, the Welsh dragon and then the ground. I thought they were gonna be this way around with the green on top of the red, but they're actually this way around so that the red hides the green on the end so the green is not visible on the inside. So that means that my flag would look like this, which is looking uh, more Hungarian than I would like. I don't know, I, d I, I don't have enough to recut it. So I think what I'm gonna do instead is just roll with it and do it the way that I had intended, like this. Uh, and so then we've got sort of a green, just general background, and then you've got the white, red, and green of the Welsh flag. But that means the location of the pocket I'm gonna have to play around with. I think I'll be able to do it because the instructions tell you to lift this layer up and seam the pocket like that. So I think I should be able to do it by lifting up this section and seaming it like that and then I won't have a visible seam for the pockets on the wrongs on the right side. Bloody typical, isn't it? Bloody typical. That's what you get when you're not on top form really and you don't read the instructions. <sighs> Having checked my revised layout would still work, I transferred all the markings for the sewing lines to create the different compartments of the pocket. I could then sew along those lines through various layers and pocket sections to create the compartments. Getting the layers in the right order and making sure everything was being stitched in the right place took more brain power than I care to admit. I also had the issue that this wool check is so loosely woven that it moved and warped out of position as I sewed, so I had to unpick a few of my lines of stitching and ease the fabric in more carefully so I didn't end up with any weird bulges. The main section has a horizontal line of stitching to stop things falling right down into the depths of the pocket, which I thought was very clever. My next task was to cover the paper hexagon template with the wool. I have done a little English paper piecing before, so I was familiar with the method. You fold the fabric around the paper template and then tack the folds in place before sewing the pieces together. Or in this case, sewing the piece onto the fabric backing. I apologise, I got a lot of footage of the back of my hand during this step, so I hope you can understand what I mean. Okie dokie, so uh, as you can probably tell by the Halloween decorations that are now up, I've been pausing on this project for just a little bit to work on something else because I was waiting for uh, some supplies to arrive in the post and those specifically were the magnets to make the pin cushion because this has a like a bracelet pin cushion that's detachable and it you know it magnets on magnets you know what I mean it fastens on with a magnet there on the pocket 
And in the instructions, it said, make sure you get magnets that are strong enough to work through several layers of fabric. And so uh, I basically just went on eBay and typed in magnets because I really didn't know where you would get sort of firstly the right size and shape of magnet, but also strong enough to go through several layers of fabric. So I ordered my magnets and uh, they turned up and it turns out I ordered 1.75 kilogram pull magnets and they came with a warning about don't put them near electrical equipment or pregnant women i mean i don't really know what to do i mean like i've got i got five of them you can only get them in packs of five but as you like i can barely get them apart they're so strong i, I could i tried this earlier this is oh my god i can't <laughs> I can't prize them apart but like i can the the magnetic field is so strong that it goes through my hand the force is strong with these magnets. I do, I did, I did find some other smaller magnets, but they're just not strong enough. They don't work through the fabric. So I think I'm going to have to use these. I just really hope Jimmy isn't pregnant. Uh, but it is obviously going to be quite annoying because you can't put your mobile phone in the pocket. So I might just have to add a note when I send it to him saying, don't put your phone in the pocket. <laughs> god, I really cannot get these magnets apart. Oh my god. <laughs> I think it will be fine. I think the fabric will sort of <laughs> make them less prone to just randomly picking up things. So yes, now I've got to, of course, uh, actually make the thing. And um, because I haven't been working on this project for a while, can't remember what I was doing. Typical. I think I've got the instructions on my phone. So stacking, bias tape, the waistband. Yes, that's what I'm worried about because I've got my, I bought these sliders from my local haberdashery, but they're 30 mil and my folder band and the waistband that I've cut is not that wide. <laughs> it's two and a half, 25 mil. So yeah, my sliders are gonna be too big. But even with, maybe with the bulk, can you see that? No, Why am I, I'm, I'm a terrible YouTuber. Do you see how that's gonna be too big? Even with the bulk of the, of the um, sateen, I think it's still gonna be too big. So I might have to order more of those. I also, to make the pin cushion, need, need a metal lid or something. Let me, let me double check. Yeah, bottle cap, but I don't think I have anything that's a, for a, like a, a jar or anything that's smaller than that. So I might have to go and buy something in a jar just to get the lid that's the right size for this pin cushion. <laughs> we shall see, we shall see. But in the meantime, yes, I've got to sew, I've got to sew this magnet in place here and I've got to assemble all the layers. So I'm gonna make a start on that. Bit of hand sewing for you. I began by sewing the little hexagon that covers the magnet into position on the base of the pocket. I pinned it in place using the pattern piece as a guide for location and then whip stitched in position along five out of six edges. I left the last edge open so I could slide the magnet in place before stitching that in place too. I fastened the thread off on the back of the pocket, but when I came to snip the thread, I ran into a magnetic issue. I had intended to paint on the words for decoration, but after I made a sample, I wasn't happy with the way the fabric paint dried. So I embroidered them instead. I used a hand-dyed silk embroidery floss that I've had in my stash since uni. It's dyed variegated colors of black and gray, and I just used a backstitch because I thought that looked easiest to read. It was also quick and easy to do, and I'm still off embroidery after the little Dorit chemisette. <laughs> I'm really pleased with how graphic the final result looks. Decoration complete, it was time to start assembling everything. All the layers got stacked in order and then sewn in place around the outside edge of the pocket. Only I had more issues with the bloody magnet. <laughs> My machine has a metal foot plate and I couldn't sew anywhere near the magnet because it kept getting stuck and dragging everything out of position. I tried again, but with no luck. In the end, I realized I could turn the pocket around and sew it from the other direction and it would miss the metal footplate. I then trimmed away some of the bulk around the edge so that I could finally move on to the binding. I opened up one fold of the binding and used my clips to hold it in place. 10 out of 10 recommend this instead of pins. There was no way I would have been able to get pins through all those layers of fabric. Next, I carefully machined the binding on using the pressed in crease as a guide. 
I went very slowly and eased everything in around the curves, as you can probably tell by the intense way I'm hunched over the sewing machine. The binding then gets turned over the raw edges and clipped in place before being hand sewn down on the back of the pocket. I'm using a felling stitch here for strength. With the binding complete, I started work on the waistband. I had to piece my fabric to get a length long enough to make the waistband, so I started by joining, clipping and pressing that seam. I then pressed the waistband where it had gotten a little warped from tearing it along the grain, before fusing the folder band to the sateen. This is sometimes called slotted interfacing, and I use it often to make things like plackets and waistbands. With the folder band on, I could attach the pocket to the waistband along the top edge. The pattern gave instructions for where to position the pocket on the waistband, so I measured and pinned to the correct distance before stitching it on. Then, with right sides together, I stitched the ends of the waistband before grading the seam allowance so that when I turned the waistband right side out, I would get a crisp corner. I then folded the waistband to the correct width along the perforations in the folder band and using my top stitching foot, stitched the waistband in half. When I got to the section that would sandwich the pocket in place, I made sure to stitch very carefully so that everything was caught securely in position. I realised at this point I had completely forgotten about this pattern piece for the scissors holster, so I decided to make it from the wool check and some cotton drill scrap I had in my stash. The pattern didn't call for a lining, but I knew the wool would need some reinforcement. I joined the two pieces along the top edge with right sides together. As the wool was very bulky, I edge stitched the seam allowance in place so I could get a nice finish across that top edge. This was difficult to do along the curved seam. It also wasn't actually that successful, so I decided to just top stitch the top edge as well. I then folded the holster in half with wrong sides together and stitched the layers together along the outside edge. I trimmed away any excess seam allowance and then zigzagged over the raw edges to prevent fraying. Then the scissors holster was complete. The next step required my least favourite craft tool, a hot glue gun. To make the pincushion, I ran a gathering stitch around the edge of the circle that would create the top of the pincushion. I then gathered it up slightly, lined it with batting, and then began stuffing it with scrap fabric cut into little pieces. This was incredibly time consuming and took much more fabric than I had expected. I was very glad of my ergonomic scissors, I tell you. Once I had enough fabric to fill the pincushion, I drew the gathering up to enclose all that stuffing and stitched the opening closed. The next step was to cover the metal lid that would be the base of the pincushion. The fabric is glued in place with hot glue, but it was at this moment that I remembered that this stupid hot glue gun doesn't really work and as I never use a hot glue gun, if I can avoid it, I haven't bought a new one. So I struggled for ages to try and get glue out of this stupid thing so I could glue the magnet in place. I was eventually able to do it, but trying to glue the fabric in place was even trickier and the glue solidified so quickly, by the time I folded the fabric into position it had already dried. I really had a terrible time with this stupid thing and many swear words were uttered, but I was eventually able to glue everything together to create the magnetic pincushion. The pincushion also has a wrist attachment, so I made mine from a loop of black elastic and hand stitched the overlap in place. I left one side open and then slid another magnet in there before stitching the opening closed. I went to test the pincushion out and was mortified to find that after that hot glue nightmare, the blasted thing didn't work. I realised that I just had the wrong side of the magnet face up in the wristband and when I turned it back around the right way, everything was fine. I stitched a little cross on the right side of the wristband as a sort of this way up marker to make sure everything worked first time for Jimmy. 
So here it is. My pocket is done. Hey, I, uh, I bought these extra strong magnets and I was worried that like they would be too strong. They came with a warning, you know. So um, yeah, I was a bit nervous about that, but it's actually not too bad. Uh, it's also got like a magnetic base for a wrist pin cushion. But of course I have uh, notoriously dinky wrists. So <laughs> to sort of guess how big your wrists are, Jimmy, I'm sorry. So I kind of put it around my forearm to see, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not a man. Yes, I won't be a, <laughs> so I hope you're not offended. If I, uh, <laughs> if I made it too small. Uh, yes, so I've had a bit of a break because I had a contract come through that I was working on instead and I needed to wait for these in the post. So these are my sliders, which are now the correct size at 25 mil. So I've just got to put these on and then it's done and it can go off to its new home with the Welsh Viking. I need to look up how to install these. I've never done these before. Yeah, I'll look it up in the instructions and finish this off and we're done. Then all I've got to do is wait for my pocket to arrive in the post. I forgot to add, I've also written Jimmy a little, a little letter about the project and I've included this postcard, which uh, is from a, like a living history site, I suppose, near me where they recreate what I would consider prehistory probably wrong about that but like neolithic they recreate like anglo-saxon neolithic roman houses and buildings and things and they have living historians there and things and so this is one of their reconstructions one of their houses and it's the i'm gonna try and speak welsh here landigai yandigai sandigai i'm not sure but it's based on one in wales and so i was like ah wales welsh welsh viking brilliant and i don't know if you notice if you watch jimmy's videos behind him on the wall in his background he has postcards and things that people have sent him in his p.o box so i thought this would be a nice little addition to that collection from uh where i am in the south downs uh yeah now i really have to crack on with the sewing <laughs> On today's episode of Random Symptoms My Body Decided to Throw at Me, uh, light sensitivity appears to be top of the list. So, so I apologize if the lighting in this video is really weird, it's because I'm trying my hardest not to have any artificial light on uh, so that I don't burn my eyes out. We do of course have this natural skylight, which I can't really do anything about, hence the sunglasses. But the reason I am here standing to you in front of my Halloweeny background is because my pocket has arrived in the post. I think I know who it's from, so I'm just going to dive right in and open it and sort of do an unboxing and see what we've got. Come on, come on. <laughs> Was I supposed to open it from the other end? No, it's one of these. <laughs> Ooh! Let's be having you. <gasps> oh my goodness, look at that! That's incredible! Oh wow! Oh my god, it's beautiful! What have we, what have we got in here? Oh my goodness, there's loads of stuff in here. To Claude, I seem to have lost the letter I wrote, so please excuse the envelope. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your pocket. It's made from vintage curtains that I also used to make my 1960s dress and a vintage hand embroidered tablecloth. Please enjoy it. I hope you have a beautiful day. P.S. from Annabelle. Sorry, it's late. <gasps> so that is that is something else that we will talk about in another video. So this is my pocket. Oh my goodness. There's, there's something inside it. I didn't put anything inside my pocket. I feel a bit naughty now. <gasps> Wait, how does this work? Yeah. Oh, it's tea. Oh my goodness. Choc chip chai, oh my goodness. Carrot cake. It smells absolutely divine in there. <gasps> oh, and some vintage buttons. Annabelle knows me too well. Is that is that all of them? I don't want to leave one in there. Oh, oh. A little handkerchief <laughs> that is absolutely gorgeous i mean you need a handkerchief in your pocket don't you at all times 
Thank you, Annabelle. This is brilliant. Oh, I absolutely adore it. How perfect is that? All right, maybe maybe we should try it on. <laughs> I am so pleased with my pocket. Thank you so much, Annabelle. I really love it. That embroidery is just mwah, so special. So I suppose that's the end of my involvement with the pocket swap. There will be more information, playlists to other people's videos, etc., in the description as usual. Huge thanks and a massive shout out to Jeanette from A Perfect Touch who did all the organizing, all the mystery secret swapping and everything so she did a brilliant job and I just want to say a big thank you for her support and everything in, in uh, organizing this it's been absolutely amazing so glad I took part and I can't wait to get some wear out of my pocket so if you are curious what else Annabelle sent me in my pocket swap pocket I suggest that you go over to Annabelle's channel Horizon Cosplay and subscribe and also of course subscribe to my channel because we're working on a little collaboration which I think uh, you're really gonna enjoy so stay tuned for that one. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.